So how do I find the sine of the arc sine or sine inverse of negative one half? Well, what, what this means is it's kind of like saying how do you square something that's being square rooted. Let's say we're taking the square root of three and we square it. What's going to happen when I square a square root? It's just going to be three. It's just going to be three because these are inverses of each other. Okay, that's essentially what the arc sign is. It's the inverse that actually a lot of times means inverse, a negative one. Sometimes you'll see it written as arc sign, A-R-C, you'll see it written that way. And some books distinguish the difference between that and some don't, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. What we're gonna talk about is how you can do this. Well, by what I just said, you would think your answer is just negative one half, right? Because they just cancel each other out, just like a squared and a square root will do, right? So you'd think that that would happen. And it does usually happen, or it can happen. The problem is there's a, there's a restriction to the argument of arc sine. Um, there are, I'm sorry, there's a restriction to the domain, domain of arc sine and arc cosine and arc tangent and arc cotangent. So you have to kind of understand what those are. So sine inverse is defined because it's gotta be a function Right? So what you're basically doing is this, this is some angle. This is literally saying the angle whose sine is negative one half. That's what that means. So this is some angle. This is the angle whose sine is negative one half. Well, if I'm taking the sine of that angle, let's call it theta, what is the answer going to be? Negative it's going to be negative one half. So we we actually do know that that would be negative one half. But sometimes you get different problems that aren't quite as simple. Cosine of cosecant inverse of negative thirteen over twelve. So to do this, well, these aren't the same function. So what you actually have to do is you have to find this angle. You have to draw this out and kind of find what that angle is. So what does it mean to be a cosecant? Well, cosecant is the inverse of sine, right? So cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite. So this is some angle theta. Remember this this whole thing right here is just an angle. This purple thing or this thing I put a rectangle around in red means the angle whose cosecant is negative 13 over 12. So that would be in um, you have to first of all you have to figure out what quadrant that's going to be in and that's going to be in this quadrant down here the fourth quadrant because sine and cosecant are defined, arc sine and arc cosecant, or the inverse of sine inverse cosecant, are defined in the first and the fourth quadrants. They're defined between negative 90 degrees and 90 degrees. And so this would be here, and so my triangle, here's my angle right here, my theta, and my triangle, remember this is the hypotenuse, and this is the opposite. So the opposite is negative 12, and the hypotenuse is 13. Hypotenuse always has to be positive. So if it's a negative 13 over 12, then you know that the negative has to go with the 12, not with the 13, because the 13 represents the hypotenuse. And so what would this side be right here? What would that side be right here, the adjacent? So this would have to be five because of the Pythagorean triple, five, 12, 13. And so what is the cosine of theta, that angle theta right there? It's five over 13. Let me go back and make a point here. Remember I said that the, the domain of the cosecant inverse is negative 90 to 90. That's true, but it doesn't including zero. It doesn't include zero. So it's actually between negative 90 and 90, not including zero. For the sine inverse, the sine inverse is defined between negative 90 and 90. Let's do another example. So let me, before I don't do this next problem, let me correct the mistake I made before. I think I said the domain restriction. I actually meant to say the range restriction of the sine inverse. The range is restricted to between negative 90 and positive 90. The range of the of the cosecant graph is restricted to between negative 90 and 90, not including zero. The range of the cotangent graph, sorry, the range of the cotangent inverse graph, the range of cotangent inverse is between 
zero and two and not two pi between zero and pi. That's the range of the cotan inverse graph. It's between zero and two pi. And so it's good to um, remember those things and understand those things um, before you actually it's not it's not it doesn't exist at at zero and two pi. So it's it's like this. It's between zero and two pi or zero and pi, not including them. So that's your uh, range of your cotan inverse. So again, let's do this problem, this new problem. So this is an angle. This is some angle theta, and the cotangent of that angle is negative three over two. So that means it would be not in the first quadrant, but it'd be in the second quadrant. And so we're going to have some. Remember, cotangent is um, adjacent over opposite. So your adjacent is three. That's three, which would actually be a negative three. And your opposite would be two, right? And so there's your angle right there. Your theta is right there. So we have to do a little bit of a little bit of math. Two squared plus three squared equals uh, d squared. So that's 9 plus 4 is 13. So d equals the square root of 13. So that's the that's the hypotenuse. I should have said h, not d, right? So your hypotenuse, which is d, is the square root of 13. So what's the sine of that angle? The sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Remember, hypotenuse is always positive. And in this case, the opposite is what? Two. It's also positive, so it's 2 over root 13, which if you simplify that would be 2 root 13. 2 root 13 over 13, if your teacher wants it written like that, that would be your answer. So to review, to do these kind of problems, you first take a look at your, your angle and you draw a triangle in the appropriate quadrant. So that's the first step. Then you solve for the missing side of the triangle, and then you find out what your new trig function is that you want based upon the side lengths that you have. But be careful with the sign, the plus minus sign of the different uh, side lengths that you're doing, and that's where the range of the inverse trig function really matters.